I'm really excited. We're, we're starting a new series today. Uh, it's on the, the book of Esther, and I'm really excited about uh, the series. But before uh, I jump into it, a couple things that I, I wanted just to, uh, to deal with. One is that Don and I just got back from our celebration of life tour that um, we do. And for those that are, are not kind of aware of what that is, when I got diagnosed with uh, stage four lung cancer, I uh, decided that every year of life that God gave me would be an act of his miraculous grace in my life. And that every year we were going to celebrate it with a uh, a celebration of life trip. I, I get an opportunity to travel a lot as it relates to all of our global partners and all of that. But this, this is simply about celebrating the gift of life that God has given uh, to me and to us as a couple. And, uh, and so we just got back on Thursday uh, from that. It was our second anniversary of the celebration of life trip. So we are super thankful uh, for that. I give God all the glory for that. Every, every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year, I view as a precious, miraculous gift uh, from God. And uh, we are just so uh, super thankful for that. Uh, we got to do it this year with some friends, and that made it even, uh, even, more, uh, even more special, some folks who have journeyed through this with us. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that I thought last week Kyle did an amazing job launching 2024. Can you show your appreciation for that? Uh, Kyle talked about I had an opportunity to, to join you from afar, and Kyle... Uh, talked about just what it what renewal looks like, and I thought it just set the table for 2024 and what God is wanting to do in our lives individually and um, and as a, a congregation. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to share is that we we have a lot of global trips that uh, are planned for 2024. Uh, one of them is a very unique opportunity. We have developed a a relationship with a ministry in Cuba. And uh, one of the members of our congregation has developed that relationship. And so we've been able to travel to Cuba. Last year we went uh, in July. uh, And it kind of turned into, as as it turned out, into kind of some medical relief and medical help. And uh, we're going again this next year in July And I just wanted to kind of put that on your radar in case you have been kind of thinking about an opportunity uh, to become active and a part of one of our global impact trips and to take a week or so uh, just to kind of pour into the lives of others that uh, are maybe going through some really, really difficult times. And uh, I wanted to show you a video of uh, some folks that went on last year's trip and, uh, and a little bit of how it impacted them. So take a look at this. As we started off the trip, one of the primary focuses outside of just loving on the people was to host this medical clinic. People from the entire country were going to be coming because as a people group, they are hurting bad. You know, one of the things we did is, is we took down a bunch of medications and um, things that we were told that they wanted, that they needed, we went to the pharmacy, and one of the things that the pharmacists and the doctors ask people when they first walk in is, what do you currently have at home? Because my, my, my shelves are bare. What do you have at home? Let's figure out what I can help you make with, the, with that uh, grouping of medications that you have, and then I'll see if there's anything else I have that can su- um, supplement that. Just amazing to watch how God works, uh, you know, through us serving people uh, through the most minuscule things, uh, but the impact that that can make. We had a couple of days where we went out at, and um, talked to people and, and talked to them about our experiences with uh, our relationship with Christ. And we had, um, there was one day, um, we really, so many people that we talked to literally 
by happenstance. I mean, it was not planned, it was not scheduled. They happened to run into us and they actually turned their, their lives over to God and to Christ at that time. And for us, it was, it was emotional as well, but watching how powerful Christ worked through, not only through us, but really through the Cuban ministry teams that were there, that really had a huge impact. The people, the way the people interacted with us was such, so powerful. And I think that after a trip like that, especially to a place like Cuba, you will come back a completely different person. The Lord has put on your heart uh, that this is something that you're meant to do. Lean into that. Um, you know, and nothing, is there's never a right time. Nothing ever falls into place, uh, but it is life-changing. They just need to be loved on. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you wouldn't get to experience otherwise, and I would highly recommend that they did. So if you're interested in uh, participating in this trip to Cuba this uh, July, uh, go to our webpage and outreach section. There's information about the cost and logistics and all of that. And uh, we're going to be taking a, a, a very diverse group down. So uh, you, you don't have to have like a particular skill set to be able to uh, participate in this in this group, uh, there's a kind of a wide array of things that we're going to be doing. And so, again, if God is kind of tapping you on the shoulder about uh, getting involved in, uh, in a ministry in this way, I encourage you to check, to check this out. All right, so we're starting a new series this weekend. As I mentioned, it's a study in the book of Esther. And just a little context uh, about Esther. The book of Esther follows the Israelites who stayed behind in Babylon after most of their friends and family had returned to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity. The, the, the Jews were in Babylonian captivity, Persian captivity for 70 plus years and, and there were different kind of returns that happened. But, but Esther kind of follows those exiles who, who stayed behind in Babylon and decided not to go back home to Jerusalem. And Esther's story begins in 483 B.C., 103 years after Nebuchadnezzar had taken the Jews into captivity, 54 years after Zerubbabel led the first group of exiles back to Jerusalem, and 25 years before Ezra led the second group of Jews back to Jerusalem. And a few years before Zerubbabel led this first group back to Jerusalem, Babylon was actually conquered by Persia, which was the which was the up-and-coming, the growing superpower at the time. And Esther's parents were apparently among those exiles who chose not to return to Jerusalem, even though the, the king of Persia at the time, Cyrus, had issued a decree that allowed them to do so. But they decided to stay in now what was Persia. So Esther was born and raised in Persia but her parents died when she was still a very young girl, and her cousin Mordecai took her in and raised Esther as his own daughter. And at this point in the story, Esther is an orphaned teenage girl living in a foreign land in a period when her people group is scattered and extremely vulnerable to those who are in power. And the king now of Persia is a guy by the name of Xerxes. And Xerxes is this very arrogant, uh, impulsive uh, kind of person. And you see that from the beginning of, of the book of Esther. In chapter 1 of Esther, we're told that King Xerxes has this banquet from all, for all of the top Persian officials. It's all guys. It's just a bunch of guys that get together. It's a banquet that lasts seven days, and it's all the food that you can eat for seven days. It's all the alcohol that you can drink for seven days. It's like a cruise without a boat. It's like just all the food, all the alcohol, all of that. And um, and not surprisingly, King Xerxes, uh, Xerxes gets drunk along with everyone else at this banquet, this drunk fest, 
And he begins to brag about the beauty of the queen who is named Vashti. But it's not the good kind of bragging. There's like the good kind of bragging about your spouse and the bad kind of bragging about your spouse. And it's not the good kind of bragging uh, where you say you think your wife is the most beautiful woman in the world. That's kind of the good kind of bragging. It's, it's the bad kind of bragging. It's where you treat your wife like one of your possessions and you show her off to make you look good. So King Xerxes summons Queen Vashti to basically come to this drunk fest, this seven-day drunk fest, and parade around in front of hundreds of drunken men. And to her credit, Queen Vashti refuses to do that. And in response, the king calls an emergency cabinet meeting and basically meets with his top officials, and the queen is stripped of her crown and banished from the, from the palace, banished into obscurity. Not only that, this is all in chapter one. So I'm not gonna read any from chapter one. I'm gonna read some things from uh, chapter two. This is all in chapter one. So go back and read chapter one, because chapter one is filled with some really, really good stuff. So not only does that happen, but the officials tell uh, they tell King Xerxes that he needs to send out a decree to all of the provinces in Persia that this kind of behavior on the part of wives will not be tolerated. And the officials are scared to death that wives are everywhere, wives everywhere might actually begin to think for themselves and start to form their own opinion about things. And that is absolutely terrifying to them. So the king sends out a decree, again, all in chapter one. You gotta read this stuff. It's absolutely amazing. He sends out a decree that basically says, this is what the decree basically says. The men are still in charge. That's the decree. The men are, just in case you're wondering, the men are still in charge and you need to respect their decisions no matter how stupid and self-centered they are. The men are still in charge, and you need to respect their decisions no matter how stupid and self-centered they are. And, of course, men have been quoting that verse ever since. <laughs> and it's like, you remember what King Xerxes said, you know? The men are in charge no matter what, how stupid we, we things we do, whatever. So uh, hopefully your view of marriage and actually your view of male-female relationships is driven more by Jesus than it is by King Xerxes. I hope, I hope that's the case. Now, since King Xerxes has banished one queen, now he has to find another queen. So he issues another decree that is basically the establishment of an international beauty pageant an international beauty contest to find his next queen. And we read about it in chapter two, and I'll just read starting with verse eight. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. Before a girl's turn came to go in to uh, see King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Six months, some of you are already boiling at this text. Like you're, you're already, it's like, I cannot believe this. Uh, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her and, uh, and with her from the harem uh, to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go. So uh, I don't have to be explicit about this. I think the text is explicit enough of what is going on here. In the evening... She would go there, and in the morning, she would return to another part of the harem 
to the care of Shaskaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle uh, Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, the, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, and the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins, so he set a royal crown on her head, made her queen instead of Vashti, and the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, Esther's banquet, for all of his nobles and officials. And he proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces, and distributed gifts with royal liberality. So the king, the king sets out to find the most beautiful women in the kingdom to vie for being his next queen. Scholars say that probably as many as a thousand young women were brought to uh, the citadel in Susa uh, to vie for being the queen of, uh, of King Xerxes. And verse 8 reminds us that these young women did not have a choice in the matter. Like they were brought by force. They were forcibly taken from their homes and they were brought to the king's summer palace in Susa and they were given year-long beauty treatments to prepare them to spend one night with the king. Now, after they spend that one night with the king, basically one of four things would happen to them. One was that if the king didn't like them, they would become a permanent part of his concubines, but never would be called to be in the presence of the king again. If the king liked them, they would become concubines that would occasionally be called to be with him. And then there would be two or three of the young women that he liked the most who would become his wives and their children would become heirs and receive the privileges of that. But then finally, the one that he liked more than all the rest, he would give a rose to and she would become his queen. I'm lying about the rose. But the bachelor basically reminds us that 2,500 years later, we really haven't come that far. <laughs> when Esther meets the king, she is favored among all the rest. So the king marries Esther, makes her his queen. So this little orphan girl from a persecuted religious minority becomes the second richest person in the land. Now, there are two things I want you to notice in this story. The first thing I want you to notice is this. I want you to notice the power, the power of culture to define who we are and to shape our identity. We're told in verse 4 of chapter 1 that for 180 days, again, you've got to read chapter 1, for 180 days leading up to the seven-day drunk fest, this this party that King Xerxes throws for all the guys for 180 days leaning up to that. King Xerxes parades all of his wealth in front of the people. It takes him 180 days to parade all of his wealth in front of the people. That's how much wealth he has. That's how many possessions he owns. And then in chapter 2, we have this international beauty pageant that we just read about. And those two events basically sum up how culture defined your worth in that time period. In the Persian culture of the 5th century B.C., 
the most important thing about a man was his wealth and power, and the most important thing about a woman was her beauty. Now, we tend to look at that like through judgmental 21st century eyes and say, that's so awful. Like, that's so awful the way those ancient cultures valued men and valued women. But we basically do the same thing today. Beauty, wealth, and power still drives our culture and determines our worth in culture. In fact, I think it's fair to say that it's even more pervasive than it was back in the fifth century BC because now it's not just men whose worth is driven by wealth and power and it's not just women whose worth is driven by physical attractiveness. Beauty, wealth, and power tend to define both men and women in our culture. In our culture, externals still matter more than what's on the inside. On a weekend where we celebrate Martin Luther King, sadly, the color of your skin still matters more than the content of your character. In our culture, what you possess, whether it's beauty or money or talent or power or connections or whatever it is, what you possess is still something that matters more than who you are. Like Esther, our culture still pushes us to undergo beauty treatments of sorts. The beauty treatments may look different at times for men and for women, but but everyone is still pushed to go through some sort of beauty treatment in order to get to the top. The good news is that Jesus sets us free from the world's beauty regiment. Praise the Lord for that whether it's the regiment to make you financially beautiful or the regiment to make you physically beautiful or the regiment to make you vocationally beautiful. It's not that those things are unimportant. It's just that because of Jesus, they no longer have to define you. Because of Jesus, they no longer have to determine your value. Because of Jesus, they no longer have to determine your worth. When you realize, when you finally realize that on the cross Jesus gave up his beauty to make you beautiful, you become less obsessed with your own beauty, whatever, however that is defined. When you finally realize that on the cross Jesus took on your ugliness so that you could take on his beauty, then you no longer find your worth, you no longer find your identity in your financial beauty or your physical beauty or your vocational beauty or anything else. You are no longer defined by those things. The Bible says that Jesus beautifully clothes us. I love this. When the Bible talks about the fact that Jesus beautifully clothes us with his righteousness like a bride on her wedding day. And in the same way that a groom looks at the bride as she comes down that aisle, that's the way that God looks at you. That he sees you clothed in the righteousness of Christ and says that no matter who you are, No matter what you have done, no matter what your story is up to this point, you are stunningly beautiful. Drink that in just for a moment. Some of you need to hear that today, that in Christ, you are stunningly beautiful. The second thing I want you to notice is how God is at work behind the scenes in this whole story from beginning to end. And we'll we'll see it throughout the whole book. What's interesting about the book of Esther is that there is no mention of God in the entire book. It's the only book in the Bible where God is not referenced at all. There's no reference to prayer. There's no reference to prophecy. There's no uh, there's no uh, anything particularly religious at all in the book. On the surface, it appears as though God is completely absent. But as you read the story, as the story unfolds, 
as you begin to understand the story, you realize that God is clearly at work behind the scenes to restore and to redeem. It may seem like Esther's journey from an orphan, teenage Jewish girl to queen of the Persian Empire was just a series of unlikely coincidences, but as you take a closer look, you see God's fingerprints all over that. God is at work even in the midst of abusive power, even in the midst of demeaning structures, even in the midst of seemingly random encounters, God is at work. God is at work working out his plan in Persia's halls of power and in ordinary Persian household. God is at work redeeming it all. Ordinary stuff is happening within this broken culture that on the surface does not seem particularly miraculous or extraordinary at all. It doesn't seem to be the stuff that we think of or we envision when we think about the God of the universe intervening into this world. When we think about the intervention of God, when we think about the miraculous activity of God, this is not the kind of stuff that we tend to think about. But behind all of this ordinary stuff, God is at work. God is positioning Esther to save her people from harm and to fulfill God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 that God would use Abraham's family, that's us, that's a whole other sermon, we'll get there through the series, that God will use Abraham's family, that's, that's us, to bring healing and restoration to the whole world. Here's the deal. Sometimes it is much easier to look back and say, well, I can see if this had not happened and this had not happened or if this had happened in a different way than I thought it was going to happen or whatever, like like I wouldn't be where I am today. It's easier to see God at work when when we look back. That there's something about looking back where we can see that God was at work in some, what seemed like some ordinary stuff, but when we look back at it, we say, wow, I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be anywhere where I am today were it not for these seemingly ordinary things that now, when I look back, I see God was at work. I, that, that's true for me when I look back at how I ended up at Fairfax. You know how I ended up at Fairfax? is that I was not the person they wanted to come to Fairfax. The way that I ended up at Fairfax is that there was a guy who I was in a little church in Indiana, an associate pastor, and uh, this church, Fairfax, had had a pastor for 23 years, and they wanted to find an associate pastor that was young that could possibly kind of have a longer run like the pastor who had just left. And so they reached out, but they didn't reach out to me. They didn't know who I was. They didn't know they, didn't, they could care less about Rod Stafford. They reached out to the other associate pastor who was on staff at South Meridian Church where I was on staff. And they asked Dale, they said, Dale, you're the guy. We've prayed about it. We've thought about it. We think, you know, we know your credentials. We know what you can do. We want you to come and be our pastor at Fairfax. And Dale said, no, I I don't think that's what God is calling me to do. But there's this other guy who's on staff at our church that I think that you ought to talk to. And 37 years later, the rest is history. I'm here because someone said no. I'm here because I was not the first choice, but the second choice. I'm here because God was at work in all of that. Now, it's easy to see that when you look back. It's easy to see when you look back that the fact that an Anderson University co-ed a co-ed decided to work for two weeks at Dorothy Blevins' beauty shop in Anderson, Indiana, 
and a youth counselor from South Meridian Church of God happened to work there at the very same time for a week and during that week said, I think you should meet the youth pastor at our church. I think you guys would be a perfect fit. And we met and six months later we were married and 44 years later, here we are. Now, it's easy to look back and to see God at work in that youth counselor working there and to see God at work in the fact that Donna worked for two weeks at the Dorothy Blevins shop. It's easy to look back and to see all of those things and how God wove all of those things together to accomplish something. But when we are in the middle of it, when it's the present and we are going through that stuff right now sometimes, it is really easy to miss what God is doing. The story of Esther challenges us to recognize that God is at work even when we can't see it. That God is at work even in the ordinary, sometimes even very messy events of life. Esther is this unlikely story that shows how God is at work even in the brokenness of humanity to do extraordinary things. And it's a reminder that God can use anyone from anywhere at any time, no matter what the story, to advance his kingdom. If God can use an orphaned teenage girl functioning in the secular, hostile demeaning environment of the Persian palace to advance his kingdom, God can use you and your unique circumstances, whatever they are, to propel his redemptive work forward. Can I get an amen for that? The story of Esther... The story of Esther is an invitation to see God at work behind the scenes to bring heaven to earth and to join God in his restorative process. It's an invitation to steward the unique positions that God has placed us in to make a kingdom impact. It's an invitation to see how God can position us for, for kingdom advance that is beyond anything we could dream, anything we could imagine when we simply say yes to his calling. I want to invite you today to pray a prayer. I have enjoyed the process when we were doing the last series. Um, I wrote a prayer for each sermon and it's just kind of become something that um, I just feel like it's something that God is able to use. And so I've written a prayer that I invite you silently uh, to pray. And as, as you hear, as you hear the prayer, wherever it is that you identify, there may be some areas where you identify very strongly. Uh, maybe some other areas where you don't identify as much. But wherever it is that you identify, I want you to make this prayer your prayer. God, I confess that sometimes I get caught up in the world's beauty regiment. I become consumed with the pursuit of financial beauty or physical beauty or vocational beauty or the beauty of success or the beauty of accomplishment or the beauty of performance or some other kind of external beauty. And sometimes I find my identity and my worth in those things. Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross and taking on my ugliness so that I could take on your beauty. 
I confess the ugliness of my sin today. Clothe me in the beauty of your righteousness and let me find my identity and my worth in you. God, I confess that sometimes when I cannot see you at work in extraordinary and obvious ways, I begin to doubt that you are at work at all. Help me to trust you even when I cannot see you. Help me to see that your hiddenness is not abandonment and your silence is not apathy. Help me to see you in the ordinary and the routine. May I see the unique circumstances of my life not as a limitation, but as an opportunity. Like Esther, may I steward the position that you have placed me in to advance your kingdom and to bring heaven to earth. I say yes to whatever it is you are calling me to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God, hear our prayers today. You know um, where we identify with this prayer. You know what is going on within our heart, the things that we struggle with, the temptations that we have. Lord, we pray that you would hear our prayers today and that you would remind us that you are willing and able to answer those prayers, to respond to our prayers. Lord, we give ourselves to you in the name of Jesus.